All right. Cool. Well, I'm excited to get into this this morning, as I always am on Sundays when I get to preach. Uh, so thanks for being here. Um, so this morning, we're going to pick up a little bit where Pastor Andy left off last week, where we came out of Easter service, Jesus has been resurrected, and, and now we're walking with the Spirit. He sent his Holy Spirit, it's in our lives, we're filled with it, and we're walking in that Spirit. And so we're going to unpack that this morning, and as we do that, I'm going to share a little bit of what Andy touched on, a little bit of what I, my experiences have been like walking with the Holy Spirit, and look at what the Word of God has to say about the Holy Spirit and walking with the Holy Spirit. The thing about the Holy Spirit is that it's a very vast and immense topic. The reality of who the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit functions is, is astronomical. And so what we're going to do this morning is just break it down into a couple of bite-sized pieces, um, some of the key things that I've seen in my life, how the Holy Spirit works, and, and, and kind of go from there. And so uh, the, the, the first way uh, the walking with the Holy Spirit has impacted and, and changed my life is, is through, uh, is, is brought freedom. And in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit is the Lord. Uh, and, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who, again, is the Spirit. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And my first encounter, my first interaction, my first experience with the Holy Spirit was when I was 17 years old. And up to this point in my life, I had come out of a lot of abuse. Anything, you know, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, you could put any Lee on the end of it, and I'd experienced it in very real ways, and so, and then it even uh, to the point when I was 15, you know, uh, my sister and I, we wound up in a homeless and runaway teen center because we, we were abandoned. We didn't have anybody. Dad was never there, and things were really, really chaotic growing up with, with, with my mom, and we'll talk more about that here in a second, <clears throat> and so it all kind of resulted and culminated into this immense amount of pain and hurt that I had in my life. And that began to fester and began to grow and to turn into bitterness. And eventually it turned into pure hatred. My life, my heart, my mind was consumed with hatred for the pain that had been caused to me in my life. And it was so intense, it was so intense to the point where I would actually have violent, murderous thoughts and dreams. I it just was consumed with hatred, consumed with it. And it, it was to the point to where... Um, there's a Christmas picture of me when I was probably 16 years old. And, you know, it's Christmas morning, and everyone's supposed to be smiling with their presents. Look what I got in my stocking. And, and the hatred is so real. Uh, the anger was so intense in me that in the picture, all I could do was literally just sneer. And I don't know where the picture is. If I find it, I will not be posting it to Facebook. But literally, it just, just glaring my teeth, baring my teeth, just pure, seething anger that I had in my heart. And that all changed uh, 3 a.m. in the middle of March, beginning of March, uh, when I was 17 years old. And I'm sitting on the phone with a friend till 3 in the morning, and this person is telling me about the goodness of God, about what it's like to know Jesus, about the joy, about the peace, about the happiness, and just how exciting it is to know God, to live with that grace that God has. And, and as this person's telling me more about it, my heart is pounding in my chest. And I'm experiencing this, this excitement that I'd never known, this thrill that I'd never known, and I had no idea what was going on. You know, up to this point, again, all the pain, all the anger, all the hatred, I'd used a lot of different substances, a lot of different drugs and different things to try to numb the pain. So in this moment, this feeling that I was having was like nothing I'd ever experienced. And my heart's pounding. And in my mind, all I can say is, God, I want that so bad in my life. And as I said that, the Holy Spirit hit me, and I didn't know what was happening. I just saw this, like, bright light, and my breath got taken away, and when I exhaled, I just wept. And I was sobbing, and I was crying, and all I could say was, thank you. All I could say was, thank you so much. Wow. All I could say was, thank you, and I just sat there, and I just wept, and I sobbed, because all of that hatred, all of that pain, all of that anger that I experienced, all of the guilt and the shame that I had for how I'd handled and, and, and reacted to and responded to 
that pain that I'd experienced, all that guilt and shame, the self-destruction of my body. I used to, as a teenager, I would, I'd cut myself. I got scars on my arm just to find a way to get rid of that hatred, and nothing helped. Everything made it worse until that moment when I encountered the Holy Spirit, and immediately it melted away. And, and from there, it's been a walk, right? It's been a, it's been a walk with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just this one singular moment, and it was a walk. But the first things, my first steps walking with the Holy Spirit, as soon as I, uh, you know, hung up on the phone, I just laid in bed, and I'm crying, thank you, thank you so much, and there's this, this relief, and this joy, and this excitement that's coming over me that I'd never known before, and I'm laying there, and the Holy Spirit, and again, I just want to say this too, uh, there wasn't like one person, or, you know, necessarily like someone said, here's, here's the next steps, here's the rules for it, this was purely a transformation, and a, a, a leading from the Holy Spirit, and as time went on, I learned more about it. So some of the language that I'm using now, I wasn't using it back then. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that everything had changed in a second. And as I'm laying there, what was happening is the Holy Spirit began to lead me, began to show me the things that, it wanted, that God wanted to change in my life as far as the lying that I'd been doing. I was a horrible liar. As far as the, the stealing different things that I'd been doing to try to take things that didn't belong to me so I could feel better, you know, um, there's even one point where the Holy Spirit's like, uh, said, I need you to change the way that you talk, because I used to cuss a lot, and if you think my humor is dark and morbid or inappropriate now, you should have met 16, 17-year-old me. And so the Holy Spirit began to say, I, these things need to change, so that way you can tell people about me. And again, I, there was no context for, for why the Holy Spirit just began doing this. And as I'm laying there, I'm just so excited, I'm like, yes, absolutely, like, I'm going to do all of these things, I cannot wait just to, just to go and to be alive for the very first time, and as I'm laying there, the Holy Spirit says, I need you to go forgive your mom, and without hesitation, at 3, 3.30 in the morning, without hesitation, <clears throat> can I get a bottle of water over there, <laughs> thanks, uh, without hesitation, thanks, uh, hold on, hesitate for one minute, please. Without hesitation, I took a few seconds to drink some water. No, uh, without hesitation, I get up 3.30 in the morning, and I go, and I knock on my mom's door. And I open the door, and I say, Mom, and she goes, <gasps> Kyle? And I could hear fear in her voice. And I used to joke that she probably thought that I'd snapped and I was coming in there to kill her. And I told her that I made that joke, and I'd share the story. And she said, no, I did. The hatred, the anger, the pain, the evil that was in me from the hatred that I had, was so real that she thought at that moment I had finally snapped and I was coming in there to harm her and her, her, her boyfriend. And so um, I open the door and I, she turns the light on quickly, like, what is happening? You know, this, this is crazy. Because I didn't talk to them. Like, I just didn't talk to them at all. And here I am, 3.30 in the room, right? In the morning. And, um, and I go in there. Man, I'm trying to, like, get it so I don't cry. <laughs> but I'm just going to cry, guys. Bear with me here. But I go in there, you know, and I just say, she said, what's going on? And I told her, I said, you know, my friend was telling me about, about Jesus, and I just want to let you know that, that I forgive you and that I love you. And we sat there, and we, we cried for a few minutes, and it's like, it was just such a powerful moment, just a transformation as, as the Holy Spirit began to, just to work in my life. And so we're hugging, we're crying, and her boyfriend's sitting on the edge of the bed with his head in his hands going, what the, like, just what is going on? Because it was such a stark 180, and it was, it was really fun. It was really exciting. I remember I got up, and I started pacing the bedroom, and I was like, we need to go to Walmart right now because it's the only place that's open. We need to tell people about this because this is insane. Like, I was completely rocked, completely transformed, and, and that was my first introduction. That was for my first experience with the Holy Spirit, and that was my first baby steps of, of walking with the Holy Spirit, and so it, it went on from there, right? That was my the first time that when I encountered God, and it went on from there to the second thing that my walk with the Holy Spirit brought out in my life, is that walking with the Holy Spirit has brought conviction. And I know that a lot of times, you know, the conviction comes, and then this freedom comes. I, I don't know why God does what he does, but I know that it's changed my life, and I know that this is my story and what he's done. And so, the Holy Spirit has brought conviction, and, uh, and I just, I do want to spend a split second uh, just to define conviction, because I think we hear that word a lot, and, and, but the context of what we're talking about, a conviction is the act of convincing a person of error or of compelling them to uh, the admission of a truth, uh, the state of being convinced of error or compelled to admit the truth. And so the Holy Spirit has brought conviction, and, and Jesus talks about this. In John 16, 7 and 8, he says, But very truly I tell you, 
It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate, or the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong, in the wrong, about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And up to this, uh, up to the, the uh, about time when I was 20 years old, I was, I'd grown a lot, and made a lot of crazy mistakes, was a little bit crazy, and by the time I was 20, I was at a point where I was able to really start being able to receive that conviction from the Holy Spirit. And, and it started when um, I was reading, I was reading a, a story in the Bible, and it's a, uh, it's a parable about the, the, the Pharisee, a religious person, a religious leader, and a tax collector. And I remember reading it, thinking, okay, that's a cool story. And then I remember being at college group at one time as well, and somebody was talking about forgiveness of sin, and somebody was talking about, you know, the, the relief of guilt, of, you know, and shame, and being forgiven of all of that. And this, this is how, how much I needed the Holy Spirit, is as I heard this person talking about sin, and righteousness, and judgment, and forgiveness, and all these things, I literally remember sitting there thinking, you know, that really doesn't apply to me. Like, like I'm grateful that God has healed me, that God has, you know, uh, made himself my father, and all these things, but this whole, like, you know, this, this sin stuff, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of good. I mean, I still had my insecurities, and my weaknesses, but I looked at those more as things where, where the Holy Spirit would come and just comfort me, right? I didn't realize that a lot of the shame, a lot of the guilt I experienced was because I had sin in my life. And that changed, like, rapidly. Uh, when I was 20 years old, after all of this happened, I was on the bus. As I'm riding on the bus, it's in Vancouver, Washington, um, I look over and I see somebody on the bus, and this person is clearly not doing well, right? And I'm sitting there high and mighty, you know, re religious spiritual Kyle, reading the Bible and listening to worship music and all these really super spiritual things, and I see that person, and I remember thinking, man, I am so glad I'm not like that person, and like a ton of bricks in my forehead, just explosion of light, that Pharisee and the tax collector story exploded into my mind, and I realized, oh my gosh, like here I am saying I'm better than this person because of these different religious spiritual things that I do, and it freaked me out. Like I just sat there realizing, like, what does this mean? Like, am, am I in the wrong and from that, from that moment, really the Holy Spirit began to walk with me through this, this, rea and this reality of conviction. And I started to realize that I did have sin. And, and, and the exciting part about it is that as I began to learn and I began to be proved wrong about what I thought sin and righteousness and judgment looked like, as that began to take place, I began to understand and realize that what Jesus did on the cross, it brought healing, it also brought forgiveness. I began to see the sin of my life and, you know, the sin of my life and the things that I'd done, what that price tag was. And I began to see that even the hatred that I experienced, that was mine. The thoughts that I had, they were mine, right? And so from, through conviction, God brought me from being a victim and from being a villain to being victorious. That conviction came in and said, no, you, you, yes, you've been hurt right? But the ways that you responded to that pain, Kyle, they're, they're not healthy. They're not right. They're sinful. Because I was selfish. I was, a, I would steal from people. I would, I would basically, I was just like this, uh, I would leech on to somebody, leech on to a situation or something and just drain it until there's no life left. Because I just needed more and more. And I thought that everything was for me. Because poor Kyle has experienced so much pain, right? And I started to realize that that was sin, I, started, I was taking things that didn't belong to me. And, and as I began to become more aware of this, you know, there was a certain element of like, oh, man, like, this sucks, <laughs> right? Like, this sucks. Like, what do I do? And as I pressed into it, and as the Holy Spirit continued to walk with me through conviction, again, I began to see the power of God's mercy, the power of God's grace, and what it actually mean, means, what it meant to me, that mercy that doesn't give me what I deserve. That grace that allows me to become more than I could be on my own. And if it wasn't for walking with the Holy Spirit through conviction, I wouldn't have come to these realities. To the reality that there's no way I could have paid or atoned or made up for my sin. That I could only have come through what Jesus did. And, and, and so that walk with the Holy Spirit, it's been, it's been, it's been an incredible thing. And, and it doesn't stop there, right? So again, we're talking about walking with the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about singular moments and everything's changed and it's all done, right? There was still pain. There was still shame. There were still things that would come up. 
right? And so when that happens, as we walk with the Holy Spirit, what do we do, right? Because if you look in 2 Corinthians, again, it says that we are being transformed. So it's, it's a process. And so I like to call the process walking in the cool of the day. And that idea of the cool of the day, it comes from uh, Genesis, I don't know if that's up yet. Yeah, it's perfect. So it comes from Genesis 3, 8, and, and it says that the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees. But the Lord God called to the, to the man, where are you? And so that phrase, the cool of the day, the Hebrew word there is, uh, I'm going to butcher it, is, I believe, ruach. And what it indicates as well is the spirit of God. And so I believe that what this verse is, is indicating, what it's showing us, is that there was a specific time where Adam and Eve would meet with their father. Because what God wants from us is not religion. What God wants from us is relationship. And relationship is a two-way street. It takes intentionality. It takes commitment, right? It takes consistency. And so that's what we're going to look at here. So as we are looking at walking in the cool of the day, as I like to call it, walking with the Holy Spirit, what that has looked like for me is over the last few years, I've taken up literally walking. Uh, there's a park in my neighborhood. Uh, Stosh caught a huge bass out there the other day. I got a picture of that. So it's, it's a very miraculous uh, park. And uh, I've been walking around it for the past probably two and a half, three years, weekly, sometimes daily. Um, and and, and in, in, that, in that time walking in the cool of the day with the Holy Spirit at the park, God has began to uh, bring about changes in my life that I believe could not have come any other way. And, and it's really funny. So I'll just share a little bit of the process of what that was like. So that way you can give some context. So because th- my hope and my hope and my, um, you know, desire here is that, you know, your heart to be stirred, your minds be activated to begin to find out ways to relate to the whole, have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, to find out what it's like for your life to walk with the Holy Spirit. What does your cool of the day time look like? When is that? It has to happen. It's a, it just has to happen. And I'm not here to kind of try to put a, a, an extra yoke or something unnecessary on you. I'm here to share that these steps and what we're talking about will bring freedom in your life. So for me, what it's looked like is as I first started walking in the park, <laughs> honestly, I was scared. <laughs> I was so afraid that I was going to go and meet with God and he was going to just... Okay, Kyle, here's what you're doing wrong. Here's what's, and what, what you're doing wrong, what needs to change. And I was a little bit afraid, right? Which I think is there's a certain amount of healthy fear when we talk about God, when we interact with God, until we get to spend time with him and realize that his strength and how terrifying he is is actually to our benefit, right? I mean, would we want to serve a God that's weak and, and flimsy or a God that's strong and kind of terrifying? I choose a terrifying God to protect me. Anyway, uh, <laughs> as I started walking, um, I was afraid, and so what I would do is the first probably week of it is I would march around the, the park, and I would pray the Lord's Prayer, like repeat it, because I didn't know what else to do, so I'd literally walk around, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be the name, your kingdom come, you, and just, just do this, because I'm like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what this is actually like, and from there, it kind of transitioned to just irritation, right, because at that point, two and a half, three years ago, there was a lot of pain in my body. There's a lot of things that I was holding on to, a lot of sin even that I was holding on to, that over the course of walking in the cool of the day, God has brought healing, God has brought freedom from. And that's why I'm sharing this with you. It's not to say, hey, you ought to do these things. I mean, you ought to, but why? Because it will change your life. And so I remember those, the, the next couple of weeks, it was just irritation. It's like I'm getting up early, I'm, I'm marching around this lake, and it hurts. My knees hurt, my feet hurt, my back hurts, like everything hurts. I kept in, I just kept pressing in, and eventually what it transitioned into was, was you know, I was out there because I was trying to find how I could be a better husband. You know, God, I need to be a better husband, I need to be a, a better father, I need to be a better pastor, I need to be a better realtor, I need, I need to be better at all these things, so I'm going to go and pray and grind through the pain and grind through and just do it, and slowly it transitioned into God saying, basically he told me as I was walking, he said, Kyle, before you're a husband, before you're a father, a pastor, a realtor, before any of those things, you're my son. And I just want to spend time with you. I just want to spend time with my son. And that was a really powerful thing for me, not having a dad, not having a dad that could take me out on, you know, on Sundays after church for, for in and out. I didn't have any of that. And so being able to find a place where there's, there's, no, there's not a religious thing that's happening, right? It's not like the Father, hallowed be thy name, you know, where, yes, there was some, 
there was some overcoming that took place. It wasn't comfortable to start. It was, it was painful. It sucked, right? Those sec- the second, third week, it sucked because I hurt, and I didn't know what was going on. It felt like a waste of time. But these little, little, little glimmers along the way gave me hope, and I kept doing it, and it got to the point where I realized that I wasn't just praying to be a better this or do better or to have better or to feel whatever. I was just connecting with my dad. And so that's what walking in the cool of the day is like. That's what God wants for us. That's what walking with the Holy Spirit looks like, to be able to continue in that freedom, to be able to continue in that conviction, to be able to be set free, to understand the mercy and the grace that God has for us. And as I've done this over the, you know, the last few years, but even before, you know, the freedom to be able to forgive, like I talked about with my mom, you know, like I don't see her as a person who has caused pain. I don't see her as someone who has abused or abandoned her children. Because of walking with the Holy Spirit, I can see her as she is, as someone who has compassion for people who can't take care of themselves, as someone who has compassion for the, for the people who are disabled, as she works and she grinds through these jobs helping uh, in an adult foster home. I see her as a person who loves my kids, her grandkids, you know, I'm sorry, and sends them books about God, it sends them clothes and sends them toys and sends them treats and just lavishes love on them. You know, we have this uh, Facebook group chat uh, with my family and like every, every day my mom is sending pictures of, of the kids, you know, from when they were babies and just like doing this. And it's just, I wouldn't, like, if it wasn't for the work of the Holy Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit in my life, I don't, I don't believe we'd be at this point, you know? And, and if it wasn't for just continuing to do so, I mean, like, how I see my father, how I see my mom, how I see myself, right? How I see sin and judgment and righteousness is changing and, and, and it's being transformed. And so that, as a, and, and like Second Corinthians says, is, you know, as we contemplate the Lord's glory, we're being transformed with ever-increasing glory. So that way I'm not reflecting my pain. I'm not reflecting my shame. I'm reflecting the glory of God. And, and it, again, it takes, it takes intentionality. It is a relationship. And so what does it look like to be walking in the cool of the day. The first step, I'm going to give you three steps, and I, I understand that, you know, God is not confined to these steps, but these are biblically accurate, and this is what my experience has been, and my experience has actually confirmed what the Scripture says. The first step is humility. And so there's a psalm, Psalm 51, 7. It says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. And then Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. This is what the Lord God says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things so that they came into being, declares the Lord? These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and tremble at my word. And then Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. So as we look at that handful of verses, what we're seeing is someone who requires, who needs, who who, who wants, rather, humility from us, right? Isaiah 66, God isn't looking for us to build some extravagant motive or to build some extravagant, you know, uh, contraption for us to be able to interact with him. He's not looking for us to, like, you know, put on a Sunday best and, and smile through the pain and do all these things. What God is looking for is just humility, those who are, have a contrite heart, contrite meaning someone who is aware of their sin and aware of their need for a holy God to love them and to forgive them. So the first step as we talk about walking in the cool of the day, in the cool of the day is humility. And the second step is to show up. Very simple, show up. Again, Genesis 3, 8, 9, the man and his wife heard the Lord, a sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? So we look at that verse, and we have to ask, who hid and who showed up? And why were they hiding? Right? Humility is that first step. Adam and Eve, they didn't have the humility to show up, and and they didn't have the contrite heart to show up where God was meeting with them, where they consistently met as they walked in the cool of the day, as they had spirit time with God, right? Right? They didn't show up. They didn't have the humility to show up and say, yeah, I was wrong. I was wrong. They hid. Who did show up? God. And what that shows us is that God, he knew. God's omnipresent. He's, he's, God, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He's everywhere. He's not, 
He's not confused about what's going on. He's aware. He's aware of what's going on in your life. He knows. He's aware of what's happening in this situation. It's just funny that he asked, where are you? God knew, okay? And he shows up anyways. He's there waiting for us at the park, at that cool of the day time for your life. God is ready to show up. He is showing up. He's ready for you to show up. He's ready for you to, to, to come with humility to say, yeah, I'm scared. Yeah, I'm angry about this. Here I am, God, in, in all of my humility. I'm not leaning on my own understanding. I'm not going to say, oh, this is how I interact with God. This is what it looks like to follow God. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust the steps. I'm going to trust the process. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to show up. And the third step uh, in, in, in this uh, is, is to receive and obey. Or listen and obey. But to receive, listen, and obey. Uh, Isaiah 30, verse 21. Whether you turn to the left or to the right, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. And it's kind of a little bit of a Mandalorian combination with Jocko Willink where, you know, walk on the path. This is the way. Um, But as you're showing up with humility, be ready to receive because the cool part about what God has in these moments is he wants to give you stuff. He's a generous God. He's generous with his love. He's generous with his forgiveness. He's generous with his direction, with his guidance for your life. He's generous. He's not withholding. Here's the thing. is God has poured out everything. He has paid every price to be able to meet with you. He has paid the highest price to be able to show up and have relationship with with you. And he's not coming as an angry person to to bring guilt and shame. He He wants to come to bring freedom for your life. And it takes humility. It takes showing up. And it takes being able to receive what God has to say, to be able to receive that love and that joy, and to receive the conviction and to respond to it in a humble way. Because I think a lot of times we've heard this, we've gotten excited, we've gone to church, you know, yeah, God wants to have a relationship with us, but where many of us, myself included, have failed is in the following through, is in the actual obedience part of doing it. And I know that as Americans, we don't like hearing about obedience because we're independent and strong and we're going to do what we're going to do. But that's not the, the way that God works. It's not the way that a true believer of Jesus works. We are humble. We are consistent, and we are obedient to what God calls for us. And the cool part about it is that his kindness leads us to repentance. And as we turn away from that sin, as we show up and we receive and we obey, that God does bring freedom. He brings fruit in your life that remains, fruit that lasts. Fruit that doesn't wither, that doesn't spoil. Fruit that you can live off of and your family can live off of. Spiritual fruit, joy, hope, peace. Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. I did a little Monday thing a couple weeks back about this as well. That's, the, that's what God wants to work in our life. That's what these steps produce. That's what this is about. That's what obedience is about. It's not about just listen and obey, a little automaton, right? To listen and obey and to receive what God has for you. And so as we wrap up this morning, I really, I, I want to challenge and encourage, you know, wh- wherever you're at with your walk, maybe you're already um, on the path. You're already, you already have found the way and you're walking in it. My encouragement for you is to s- keep going, is to don't stop. That God has so much more for you. That he's, he's, he's immense, he's unending, he's infinite. His love, the power that he has for your life, what he wants to do in you and through you, the things that he wants to deposit and the things that he wants to take out of your life, He's excited to show up and meet with you and to do that. And if you are, for the first time, kind of just hearing about this and what it looks like to walk with the Holy Spirit, my hope is that this is very simple. Very simple. And again, it takes just humility, recognizing your need, right? Showing up when, I don't know, that's up to you. That's up to you. Everybody's unique. Everybody's individual. It works well for me to go to the park and pray. It works really well for me to to wake up in the morning and do a Bible time on a Zoom call with a friend. And, And But what does that look like for you? What is your cool of the day? And so I'm excited to see what God begins to do in your lives and and what, you know, he brings out, what he puts in. So I'm going to wrap up and pray and we'll get out of here. So, Father, I thank you so much.
for your goodness in my life, God, for the freedom that you've brought, God, for allowing me to be able to see myself and the people in my life and to see you, God, as things truly are and as to continue to understand that more and more as I contemplate and as I learn more about your glory and who you are. God, I pray this morning, Father, that there would just be a great sense of hope and encouragement, Father, that, that the experiences that I've had and the reflection of my life would, would inspire people to dig into you, to press into you, to, to just take these steps, God, to be able to receive what you have for them and to follow through with it and to watch their lives change and to watch the lives of the people around them change. God, this is what you do, and we're grateful for it, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so there's, uh, thank you, wow, wow. I'll be here all week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Perfect. So don't, don't leave. We love fellowship. We love hanging out. We love getting to know people. Again, you know, connect with somebody uh, that's part of a community group and see what you can jump into this, uh, this Tuesday. Down the hall is the fellowship hall, and there's snacks, and there's goodies, and there's coffee, and there's ways to be able to hang out and see people. And so, um, yeah, we'll see you all next week. <laughs>